So uh, here's where it all ends up, Act 5, Scene 2. Uh, a long one, the second longest uh, scene in the play, and like so many uh, of the scenes uh, in the play, it contains any number of uh, tonal shifts. Um, we begin, or very nearly begin, uh, with uh, daringly, I think, for the, the last scene of a tragedy, um, more comedy. There, there was a and a rather extended uh, funny part, even in the very last scene, the exchange with Osric. Um, and uh, where we all end up, well, it, it is uh, a long sword fight that can be uh, thrilling in performance, of course, but for uh, students who are reading the play, doing it you know, aloud in class or reading it on your own, the, the last scene uh, can seem sort of underwhelming textually. It's, it's just a bunch of you know very quick one hit, no, yes, judgment, have at you now, you know, it, exclamations going on during um, uh, a sword fight. Uh, but but it's important to remember, and this is, is a good scene to remind us um, that you know Shakespeare is though he is writing a verse drama. You know th this this is not a poem. It is a play. It is supposed to be watched um and and what would be a a big finish a very exciting sword fight on a stage or in a film uh is can uh, hard to follow and and uh, lyrically underwhelming on the page the reason of course uh, is that we're supposed to be watching it anyway uh the first couple of pages before the entrance of the aforementioned osric the first couple of pages of uh 5.2 is hamlet bringing horatio up to speed on uh, what happened on the uh the uh, ship that was bringing him to england before he had jumped off of it to get a ride from the pirates uh bringing up him up to speed uh specifically on what uh uh what Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have in store for them uh, when they uh, arrive in England, where they are uh, uh, holding, that they are holding their course for, as his first letter told us in 4.6. Um, uh, Hamlet relates that he was oh, well, suspicious for no reason, uh, or as he puts it, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Uh, as a result of this, he got up and uh, snooped through Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's uh, luggage. Um, in the dark, groped I to find out them, had my desire fingered their packet, and in fine withdrew to mine own room again, making so bold my fears for getting manners to unseal their grand commission, where I found uh, royal knavery and exact command. Uh, larded with many several sorts of reasons, importing Denmark's health and England's too, with oh such bugs and goblins in my life, that on the supervised no leisure baited, no not to stay the grinding of the axe, my head should be struck off, lines uh, 13 through 24. In other words, uh, uh, on a hunch, she snooped through Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's uh, bag and found the letter from Claudius uh, to the King of England, uh, uh, ordering his death. Um, but I want to draw your attention to what he says right before he launches into this story. Um, lines oh, 8 through 10, let us know our indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our deep plots do, Paul, and that should learn us there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. Um, now, being in oh, only his uh, second speech in this scene, um, this reference to a divinity shaping our ends um, can be, and I think should be, uh, jarring to an audience that's been paying attention. Uh, significantly, uh, Hamlet got through the entire last scene, the great graveyard scene, uh, without any mention of divinity, uh, and certainly not any implication that divinity shapes our ends, aside from uh, one quick mention of uh, the fact that the uh, pate of a politician might circumvent God, might it not, when the skulls are rolling across the stage. Hamlet doesn't mention God uh, or anything of the sort once in all of the graveyard scene, though he mentions God rather frequently elsewhere. Uh, we discussed in the video for 5.1 how um, he, he, with this, uh, you know, 
trace the noble dust of Alexander till the find it stopping a bunghole stuff with this imperious Caesar dead and turned to clay might stop a hole to keep the wind away stuff. He, he, he is uh, verging on the creation of a sort of uh, a utterly secular or utterly earthly, utterly mechanical way of expressing something like a divinity uh, in language without any reference to uh, any gods and, and heavens and hells. Uh, yet uh, suddenly uh, at the very beginning of 5.2, we're back to something like predestination uh, with a divinity shaping our ends. Um, but in, in uh, Hamlet's case, it's more like a divine guidance. Um, and as far as what uh, he did, or in, uh, as he would tell it, uh, what this divine guidance made him do, right, in lines uh, 30, 31, uh, or I could make, or meaning before, uh, or I could make a prologue to my brains, they had begun the play, I sat me down, devised a new commission, etc. Uh, and, and he then discloses to Horatio how he uh, did a switcheroo with the letters, wrote his own uh, forgery from Claudius, uh, and, and replaced it with the first letter ordering the deaths of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Um, Horatio is shocked uh, in line 56, so, Rosen, so Guildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it, in other words, going to their deaths. Uh, Hamlet makes no secret of the fact that, uh, in his opinion, they deserve it. Why, man, they did make love to this employment. They are not near my conscience. Now, um, how much Rosencrantz and Guildenstern ever had any idea uh, of what this employment really entailed? You know, they were sent for, they were promised rewards, it had something or other to do with uh, talking to Hamlet and reporting back to the king. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of, of characters who never really had any idea um, what the hell's going on, they're, they're second probably only to Ophelia. Um, Horatio doesn't uh, take issue uh, with this, though, uh, you know, certainly I think this uh, scene or this exchange can and should be played with an expression on, on Horatio's face indicating that he's not totally uh, on board with this. Um, now, uh, aside from the, the um, mercilessness uh, of it, of, of, of his his arranging the deaths of, of char characters that you could make a pretty good case uh, don't deserve death. Now, this is reminding us, of course, of, of uh, Hamlet's um, uh, the state of, of, of being utterly unbothered uh, back in 3.4 when the curtain is pulled back uh, to reveal that he has uh, actually accidentally killed Polonius. Um, Upon, upon seeing his face, it's just, uh, take thy fortune, thou finds to be too busy is some danger. In other words, you know, th this is what you deserve for uh, hiding behind curtains and spying on people. Uh, we have a similar, they did make love to this employment, they are not near my conscience, uh, dismissal uh, of any idea that Hamlet should feel guilty, or should feel any guiltier about the, the deaths that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern uh, his old friends are headed to uh, than he felt about the, the death of Polonius. Um, what is even more interesting, perhaps, um, is that he uh, thrice or two and a half times attributes this to God, right? Um, before he even starts telling the story of what he did, um, he acts as though God was just uh, pulling the strings. Um, there, there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will, uh, succeeding to being thus benetted round with villainies, or I could make a prologue to my brains, they had begun the play, in lines 29 through 31, the implication being um, God was acting through me with this switcheroo the letters plan before I even knew what I was doing, and then putting the capper on it uh, at line uh, 48 when Horatio curiously chooses to ask, how was this sealed? You know, as though the issue is, oh, well, you know, how did you close up the envelope? Um, Hamlet responds, 
why even in that was heaven ordinant. I had my father's signet in my purse, etc. In other words, he was able to make the forgery look good, make it uh, the idea that this was really a letter from the king of Denmark look good because he had his dad's old ring uh, in his uh, backpack um, and was able to wax impression over the seal to, to make it look, look the better as though it had come from the king. Um, but he attributes this again to God, as even in that was heaven ordinant. So Hamlet is either talking like he believes or possibly really does believe uh, that God really wanted him to kill Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and was, was uh, tossing out some minor miracles all the way to, to help him do it. Uh, now, this reminds us of something very similar, he said, um, in 3-4 uh, regarding the death of Polonius. Um Heaven has seen fit to punish me with this and this with me, that I must be their scourge and minister. Uh, in other words, you know, God wanted Polonius dead. And, uh, you know, for, for reasons known only to him, he picked me to carry out his will. So uh, every death that Hamlet is responsible for in this play, he is... Um, either really believes or is um, you know, really putting in the effort to try and convince himself that uh, uh, God wanted all these people dead and he himself was just uh, the instrument. Um, questionable theology, uh, to, to say the least, but that's, that, that's his story and he's sticking to it. Um, we might also notice uh, around line 65, uh, when he's talking yet again about how he's totally going to kill Claudius this time. Um, Does it not think thee stand me now upon he that hath killed my king and whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cousinage, it's not perfect conscience to quit him with this arm, and it's not to be damned to let this canker of our nature come in further evil. In other words, I, at this point, Claudius is such a terrible guy that you know, my soul might be damned to hell if I don't kill him. Um, no mention of, of uh, any, any risk of damnation for killing all these other people who didn't deserve it, which he was just talking about. Uh, the most interesting line here for me is 65. Uh, Hamlet is upset, uh, not just that Claudius hath killed his king and whored his mother, but next line, popped in between the election and his hopes. This is the first and only time uh, that Hamlet has made any mention of wanting to be king. Suddenly, uh, not just the murder of the old king the, and the betting of the queen, um, but the fact that Claudius became king when, when Prince Hamlet himself should have. It hasn't been one of the charges before. Hamlet has never seemed terribly interested in being king himself. Um, indeed, it, it, one might suggest that that's the reason, or at least one of the many reasons, you know, I, I think if we're trying to look for just one, uh, you know, we're probably oversimplifying things, though, though of course, the, um, the temptation to find the one reason that, you know, he can't kill Claudius, as uh, Sigmund Freud famously thought he had found, um, is, is, is tempting. I think there isn't probably one and only one reason, uh, but one of them uh, might be that, you know, if he kills Claudius, then he has to be king. And uh, it, it has certainly for the whole play so far seems to me like Hamlet is not particularly interested in being king. Uh, he'd certainly rather be an actor uh, and probably be no, it's any number of uh, other jobs besides, uh, rather than than actually have to be king. Um, but uh, in line sixty-five of uh, Act Five, Scene Two, he acts like this was what he uh, was wanted. Whether we believe him or not, uh, whether you know, how that line should be delivered um, can vary. Uh, now uh, he goes on to say. Uh, but I am very sorry, good Horatio, in line 75, I'm very sorry, good Horatio, that to Laertes I forgot myself. He is belatedly apologizing and to the wrong guy uh, for what a jerk he was to Laertes uh, uh, heckling uh, his sister's funeral in the previous scene. 
I'm sorry that I, to Laertes, I forgot myself, for by the image of my cause, I see the portraiture of his, apparently finally belatedly realizing that the two of them have a lot uh, in common. Uh, both, after all, uh, want revenge for, for dead relatives. Uh, both were mourning those uh, dead relatives in, in ways that other people found uh, inappropriate or shocking. Uh, so Hamlet, in this speech, realizes uh, the... the uh, extreme hypocrisy he displayed in the previous scene uh, a bit too late. Um, like uh, the last couple of pages of the previous scene, I find this speech weird in terms of how it should be played. Uh, is Hamlet a completely serious here? If he's not completely serious, that means he's BSing Horatio because Horatio is the only guy around. And what's the point of that? Uh, the question of whether Hamlet is ever to any extent dishonest with Horatio, who we've seen the whole time as the, the one guy he's completely honest with, um, is, is an, an open question. I think it's hard to take seriously. Um, that might be a reason why this little speech about being sorry about his, his behavior to Laertes um, didn't appear in uh, the second quarto. Uh, it appeared only in the first folio after Shakespeare's death. So it must have been um, added by uh, Shakespeare at uh, some point between uh, 1605 and, and his death. Um, or maybe it was one of these things that he had originally and then took out and then put back and then took out a, a speech that he couldn't make up his, his mind about. Um, Certainly, I think it, it, tonally, it's, it's difficult to deliver. I mean, it's one of the places where we just, to put it bluntly, find it difficult to believe Hamlet. Um, you know, we, we, we like the idea that he's messing with everyone else, uh, except for Horatio. Uh, lying to, being dishonest, dissembling to, putting on a, a antic disposition for all of the other characters in the play. But we like to think that we, the audience, know when he's telling the truth and when he's not. The places where even we can't decide whether we believe him uh, make us deeply uncomfortable. Um, uh, as if even Shakespeare himself wanted quickly to put this out of our minds, uh, right after the, the plan to apologize to Laertes, uh, Osric enters uh, right after line 80 for the last humorous scene in the play. Um, now, uh, the, the joke with Osric uh, is that he is a, uh, a fop, uh, a, a, a flatterer. Um, now, this is not a figure of fun that is, is historically accurate to uh, the, the place 11th century uh, medieval setting. It is it is yet another one of the places where uh, Shakespeare takes something that, that was actually a recent phenomenon, a contemporary, a Renaissance phenomenon, and just plonk inserts it uh, into this play that is supposedly taking place in the Middle Ages. Um, I mean, really, the entire last scene, uh, the, the, the fact that it's leading up to a fencing match with rapiers, uh, to do something, a, a, a sport that was less than a hundred years old uh, when the play was written, uh, being, inser being inserted into uh, something supposedly taking place in the Middle Ages. Um, Dost know this waterfly, Hamlet uh, asks aside to Horatio. Uh, Horatio answers in the negative, and uh, Hamlet explains, thy state is the more gracious, for tis a vice to know him. He hath much land and fertile. Let a beast be lord of beasts, and his crib shall stand at the king's mess. Tis a chuff, but as I say, spacious in the possession of dirt. Um, echoes of the uh, uh, great buyer of land, uh, whose uh, skull we encountered in the previous scene, uh, and how, uh, when it's all said and done, the uh, inheritor himself must have not a jot more. Um, uh, Osric, because he owns a lot of land, is permitted to... Uh, 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 flounce about uh, at court, flattering everyone. Um, now, uh, the joke with him uh, is, is that he, kind of like how the joke with, with Polonius back when Polonius was alive, remember him, uh, was that Polonius went on too long, over-explaining simplistic things. Um, 
you know, most famously in, in uh, 2.2, where he makes his famous observation that brevity is the soul of wit in the middle of a speech that could have stood to be much briefer than it is. Uh, the joke with Osric is that he uh, goes out of his way to use big words. Uh, it would have fit right in, in that respect, in your average uh, freshman comp class. Uh, so after initially uh, uh, messing with him about uh, whether his hat is on or not, um, from lines uh, oh, 90 through uh, 102, uh, knowing that uh, uh, since he himself is the prince, the flatterer uh, Osric will agree with whatever Hamlet says. Hamlet goes back and forth between acting like it's hot in the room and acting like it's cold in the room so that Osric will back and forth uh, take off his hat because it's hot, then agree that it's cold and put on his hat because it's cold. Um, Osric uh, realizes that, that Hamlet is, is messing with him and, and finally politely, nay, my lord, for my ease in good faith in line one or two, okay, I get you're messing with me, just let me deliver this this challenge to you. Um, now, uh, he obviously hasn't uh, done his homework if, if he thought it would be a good idea to have a big words contest with Hamlet. Uh, his entry... Sir, here is newly come to court Laertes, believe me, an absolute gentleman, full of most excellent differences, a very soft society, and great showing, indeed, to speak sellingly of him, he is the card or calendar of gentry, for you shall find in him the continent of what part a gentleman would see. Uh, Hamlet's response? Sir, his definement suffers no perdition in you, though I know to divide him inventorially would dizzy the arithmetic of memory, and yet but you're neither in respect of his quick sale, but in the verity of extolment I take him to be a soul of great article, and his infusion of such dearth and rareness as to make true diction of him, his semblable is his mirror, and who else would trace him his umbrage, nothing more. Hamlet wins. Uh, now, this is a joke that can be uh, difficult to get if you're just reading it, especially if you're a Shakespearean beginner. Uh, after all, it probably just, just as it was hard to get the joke with Polonius earlier in the play, right? Um, because it probably, it might seem to you as though everybody in Shakespeare takes too long to say things. It might seem to you as though everybody in Shakespeare, um, uses lots of big words for no reason. Um, but again, uh, just as with the, the sword fight at the end, um, this is something that we are supposed to be watching, not just reading. Um, and so that it is on the actors to make clear uh, what the joke is in this exchange between Osric and Hamlet. Osric is, is showing off his, his um, refinement uh, just as, as his, his clothes probably are. He's usually dressed uh, in, in, in uh, some sort of ludicrously modish uh, outfit. Um, and his, his speech echoes this. Uh, he uses fancy words constantly for absolutely no reason. Hamlet responds by showing him, you know, I can do that if I want to, I just don't want to, right? The, the issue is not uh, intelligence. The issue is whether, you know, I feel like looking uh, like a dumbass. Uh, I don't and you do. Um he, he continues messing with him, lines uh, 118 through uh, 145, as uh, Osric is trying to deliver the news uh, of, the, of the challenge that Laertes is uh, unfellowed um, in the use of his weapon. Uh, we're reminded at uh, line 137 that this is uh, rapier and dagger, totally anachronistic uh, for the for a Middle, age, uh, middle Ages setting. Um, he is... Uh, calling the hangers, the carriages. Uh, now this is, um, it, it doesn't stick out today, but it, it, carriage or carriage having a French etymology and hangers, a more Anglo-Saxon or, or Germanic root. Um, th this marks uh, Osric as, as uh, a modish uh, show-off. He's using these, these French-derived terms. Um, the term carriage at that time was apparently so new that even Hamlet uh, doesn't know uh, what it means. Asking at line 145, what call you the carriages, uh, causing Horatio to respond uh, in maybe his funniest line, 
I knew you must be edified by the margin here you had done, line 146. Uh, in other words, saying to Hamlet, I knew that before this conversation with Osbert was over, uh, you would have to look at the marginal notes to see what a word means, just as we do so often today when we're reading Shakespeare. See, here is the margin uh, down there telling you what all the big words mean. Um, so as though... Uh, you know, the, the, the joke of knowing that they're characters uh, in a book um, is, is contagious, and even Horatio is beginning to catch on now. Um, uh, I knew you must be edified by the margin or you had done, as though you can look at the margin of real life to see what a word means. But, of course, if, if you live in a book, you can. Uh, Osric is finally uh, uh, prevailed upon uh, to shut up. Uh, Hamlet gets uh, one last uh, joke at his expense as he's leaving. Um, Hamlet answers the challenge uh, in the affirmative. Uh, Let the foils be brought, the gentleman willing, the king hold his purpose, I will win from and I can. Osric asks at line 166, shall I deliver you so? Uh, and Hamlet responds, to this effect, sir, after what flourish your nature will. Uh, meaning, you know, as long as you get the point across that I accept the challenge, you can take 10 minutes to say it in a bunch of stupid words if you really must. Um, as, as soon as his back is turned, getting out uh, the other excellent joke, I did comply, sir, with his dug before I sucked it. Uh, in other words, this guy is such a phony uh, that even when he was uh, nursing as a baby, he had to, to flatter his mother's nipple um, before, before attaching himself to it. Uh, for some reason, a second lord, uh, indicated simply as lord, comes in two seconds later to remind uh, Hamlet about the, uh, the challenge from Laertes, um, that even though Osric just did. And after he leaves at line uh, 190, we get an uh, abrupt tonal shift. Uh, when Horatio uh, observes, you will lose this wager, my lord, uh, in line 192. Um, now, in a film, this can be helped along by you know, the music suddenly changing, or, or, but, but I think even in the absence of those cheats, it's clear that there has been a sudden uh, a shift in tone and that uh, Horatio's you will lose this wager my lord does not merely mean uh, that Laertes guy is real good at fencing but means you know they're trying to kill you um, if your mind dislike anything obey it I will forestall their repair hither and say you are not fit uh, you know if you're suspicious, I guess echoing Hamlet's suspiciousness, his correct, his validated uh, uh, suspicion at the beginning of the scene uh, about uh, what, what was really up with the mission to England. Hamlet at this point, it seems in, in his special providence speech starting around line 202, shares in Horatio's um, suspicions about the, the real nature of this challenge, but is past Karen. Um, uh, knowing uh, perhaps that his time is limited, right? Because um, earlier in the scene, uh, Horatio had observed around line 71, it must be shortly known to him from England what is the issue of the business there. You know, the news that you... Uh, switched his letter and had Rosencrantz and Guildenstern executed. He's going to hear about that eventually. Hamlet's response, it will be short. The interim is mine. Uh, meaning, uh, well, yes, but don't worry, I'll, I'll um, put my plan into action before the news reaches him. Um, so whether the uh, setup of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to be killed in England is um, partially is really because Hamlet thinks that they deserve to die or Hamlet just uh, lighting a fire under his own butt, knowing, well, once I do this, there's no going back. I have to hurry up and kill Claudius before he finds out what I did. 
um, possibly even at that early line, uh, already knowing that th this the, the revenge mission will claim his life as well. It will be short, the interim is mine, and a man's life no more than to say one. Now, that idea that a man's life is no more than to say one, right, that, that it's we're here for a moment and that's all, um, almost a, 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 a poetic assessment, right? The idea that unlike a uh, novel or a play, which is a sequence of events, a lyric poem is a single moment, Right, a single emotion frozen in time, uh, the, this uh, poetic idea of a life, that it is not a series of events, but a single meaning, a single moment. Um, it is echoed in, in the, the more famous lines that Hamlet uh, begins speaking around 202. Uh, not a wit, he responds to Horatio, meaning, no, no, don't, no need to tell them I'm sick. I'm going to see this thing through whatever comes. Not a wit, we defy augury. Interesting, since he had just said a couple of pages ago that there's a divinity that shapes our ends. You know, uh, uh, that divinity that shapes our ends at the same time is unknowable. We defy augury, meaning we cannot be predicted. Uh, I guess not by anyone uh, save God. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow, more about everything being part of God's plan. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. Uh, the unstated but implied antecedent of it being, of course, death. Um, uh, so so the, the gloss here being, well, um, if, you're, if you're about to die now, the good news is you don't have to die later. Um, you know, if you're not going to die later, then that must mean you're going to die now. Um, the readiness is all, um, he famously concludes. Everybody's got to go sometime, and it's not about how long you have since a man's life is no more but to say one. Life is a, a blink of an eye anyway. What's a few years or a few decades here or there? Uh, uh, mentally preparing yourself for it, and I suppose going out in the right way is what matters, the readiness is all. Since no man of aught he leaves knows what ist to leave betimes, let be. Since no man of aught he leaves knows what ist to leave. Um, in other words, since we don't understand life anyway, uh, why should we be concerned about leaving? It? You know, uh, not only do we not understand the next world, uh, you know, which, which Hamlet has, has um, referred to more than once as a great mystery, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, um, except his dad, of course, and he's saying this anyway. Um, he's, he's expanded that uh, mysterious nature into this life, right? It's, it's not just the next world that we don't understand. It's this one. We don't even know what's going on in this one. Uh, since no man of aught he leaves knows what is to leave, let be. So, so here we have uh, Hamlet um, of three and a half centuries uh, early coining the phrase, uh, let it be. Um, and that's not the half of it, quick aside. Uh, the Beatles' Let It Be inaugurated what's called the uh, power ballad progression. Right uh, from the root to the uh, dominant to the uh, aeolian to the subdominant. Now, since "Let It Be" is in the key of C, uh, with reference to that song, that would uh, make our chord progression C, G, uh, A minor, and F. Uh, now, this, if we wanted to transfer it into a different key, uh, could be written as uh, uppercase Roman numeral one, uh, room, uppercase uh, five, lowercase six for a minor, and uppercase four. Uh, the root, the dominant, the aeolian or relative minor, and the subdominant, or one, five, six, four. Shakespeare was born in 1564. You can't make this stuff up. Anyway, a table is prepared. There is a flourish of trumpets. Uh, everybody enters and... Um, why not cut a scene here and have it be you know, 5.2 and 5.3? Um, 
Well, uh, I, the, the, the roller coaster, including the, the joshing with Osric and everything else in, in 5.2, I think is part of what makes the end so, so long and weird. Uh, as though we've got another uh, take on, on the, the roller coaster ride of uh, 2.2 finishing us off here. Um, we get a, an extended apology to Laertes, uh, beginning uh, with Give me your pardon, sir, I have done you wrong, in uh, line 208. Again, I think this is tonally difficult to play. Um, uh, should it be played as though Hamlet is BSing or flattering Laertes? Uh, should it be played as though he is completely serious and expects to be forgiven? Um, you know, if he does expect that, it makes him seem a bit naive. Uh, in any case, Laertes uh, admits that the apology half works. Uh, I am satisfied in nature, he says, whose motive in this case should stir me most to my revenge. But in my terms of honor, I stand aloof. In other words, I forgive you in my heart. I forgive you emotionally, um, but in terms of my duty. I don't forgive you. So here we have one last division between uh, uh, loves and duty. Um, a, a division, right, between what's in our hearts and what our responsibilities are in terms of our social identity, our profession, our familial relations, etc. Uh, this is a division that closed the very first scene of the play uh, right, with uh, Horatio and the guards deciding uh, to tell Prince Hamlet that they've seen uh, his dad's ghost. Um, do you uh, consent we shall acquaint him with it as needful in our loves, fitting our duty? Um, it, it is echoed uh, in the closing lines of the next scene of 1.2, right after they tell him. Uh, uh, our duty to your honor, they say, uh, your loves as mine to you, he responds. Right, The fact that we're friends is more important that I'm the fact, than the fact that I'm the prince uh, and I outrank you. So uh, this this uh, division between uh, loves, our loves and our duty, what our heart tells us to do uh, versus what our social responsibilities say we have to do is echoed here in Laertes's uh, distinction between being satisfied in terms of nature, but not in terms of honor um, in, in his speech from uh, 226 to uh, 233. Um, the foils are uh, brought out. Uh, um, Laertes takes up the, the uh, unbaited, the uh, unblunted one, um, rubbing surreptitiously once it poses the poison on it. Um, uh, so it's Claudius' turn to set up the poison chalice, uh, which he does in the speech starting at 2.49. Uh, if Hamlet give the first or second hit or quit in answer of the third exchange, let all the battlements their ordnance fire. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath. So there's uh, Claudius's whole uh, shoot off cannons while I drink thing. The king's rouse that we heard about back in 1.2, but again in uh, 1.4, a custom that Hamlet did not think much of. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath, and in the cup and union shall he throw. Uh, richer than that with which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn a union meaning a pearl. Uh, that actually was uh, a thing way back in the day. Uh, royalty, when they were celebrating something, would pearls apparently dissolve uh, in wine. I no idea whether they still do. Probably these days they treat them with something. Um, but just to, uh, to show off how rich they were, uh, kings and the, the ancient and I guess the medieval world too, would celebrate things by uh, dissolving pearls in wine and uh, uh, drinking it, just as today uh, you hear about rich jerks putting gold on pizza. <laughs> um, now, uh, uh, whether the one of the chalices is also poisoned uh, or whether Claudius is, uh, the, the poison is, is disguised as the pearl is unclear. Uh, it can be played either way. Um, uh, Hamlet and Laertes begin uh, fencing at uh, around line uh, uh, 262, uh, and Hamlet does, in fact, gain the first hit. Uh, a hit, a very palpable hit, as Osric uh, admits uh, at line uh, 263. Um, Claudius goes to give him the poison cup, 
um, and Hamlet uh, declines it. I'll play this bout first, set it by a while uh, at line 266. Now, whether that's because Hamlet suspects uh, that it's poisoned or he just uh, is uh, doesn't feel like drinking because he's taking the fencing match seriously or um, perhaps doesn't drink uh, at all. Um, you know, he, he's only ever spoken of Claudius's drinking with, with contempt, most notably in Act 1, Scene 4. Um, his line to, to Horatio when Horatio first comes up to in 1.2 that... Uh, uh, will teach you to drink deep ere you depart is probably supposed to be taken as uh, ironic. Um, it, it's worth noting that usually in Shakespeare's plays, the characters who do drink are the good guys that we're supposed to like, and the characters who don't drink are the uh, the bad guys that we're uh, not supposed to like. Abstemiousness is usually a bad sign where Shakespearean characters uh, are concerned. Uh, one thinks of, uh, say, Malvolio in Twelfth Night, uh, among other examples. But Hamlet is is nearly unique as uh, an abstemious uh, good guy. Um, well, how good he is, I suppose, is is a questionable, but uh, an abstemious point of view character or, or hero. Um, now, look at what happens next. Uh, the queen comes up to him to rub his brows, uh, uh, humorously opining that he's fat and scant of breath at line 269. Now, uh, people like to argue about that choice of words, um, especially now, the, you know, the, the, the fat acceptance people like to argue that Hamlet is actually fat and that, that fat actors uh, should be cast uh, as the melancholy prince. Uh, others uh, argue that uh, uh, he's fat um, was, you know, Shakespearean slang for uh, he's all sweaty. Um, and that uh, it doesn't actually mean that, that Hamlet is a, a portly or a husky gentleman. Um, certainly it would seem inconsistent with his um, abstemious uh, uh, religious persnickety uh, personality. Um, but um, whether it's just supposed to mean that he's uh, sweaty, uh, whether it's perhaps uh, uh, Shakespeare maybe having a bit of fun at the expense of Richard Burbage, perhaps Burbage, who originally played Hamlet, had been putting on weight recently, and Shakespeare's just you know getting the audience to laugh at him uh, with that line. You can almost imagine Burbage as Hamlet in the middle of the dueling scene, you know, shooting Shakespeare a look off stage. Shakespeare chuckling, if that is, is indeed what's going on here. Um, uh, I, I doubt that we are actually supposed to uh, imagine Hamlet as a fat guy. He does um, uh, make fun of Claudius for being fat uh, in, in uh, Act 4, Scene 3. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable service, two dishes but to one table, there's the end. Um, but of course, if Hamlet uh, called someone fat while he is fat himself, it certainly wouldn't be uh, the only hypocritical thing that uh, Hamlet says. So I, I suppose it's still possible. Um, more importantly, however, the queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet, in line 271. Gertrude takes up the cup that had been intended for Hamlet. Um, uh, the king lets out a Gertrude do not drink at line uh, 273. She responds, I will, my lord, I pray you pardon me, downs the wine, causing the king to whisper to himself, it is the poisoned cup, it is too late. Now, a um, couple of questions here. So Gertrude has uh, drank the poison wine intended for her son. Claudius has... Uh, not put a great deal of effort into stopping her. Um, you know, we, we've, we've, we heard from him twice uh, about how much he supposedly uh, loves her, um, uh, citing his queen along with uh, my crown and my known ambition as one of the, uh, his, one of his motivations for the murder back in act three, scene three, when he's praying. Um, he, he elaborates further upon his love uh, for Gertrude, uh, to uh, Laertes at the beginning of 4-7. Um, she is so conjunctive to my life and soul that as the star moves not but in his sphere, I could not but by her. Um, 
you know, the strong words for uh, a woman that he makes very little effort to to stop from drinking poison uh, here in Act 5, Scene 2. Now, it can be played a little more forgivingly to Claudia, so you, you, you could, though there is no stage direction, um, Shakespeare often omitted those. Uh, it could be played as though he, it, it, you know, bell screams, Gertrude, do not drink, and, you know, leaps across the stage to try and knock the cup out of her hand. That would have everyone kind of looking at him funny. Um, it, it would give away the whole poison cup plan. So usually this is played as, you know, he doesn't want her to die, but he's got to choose between her and uh, finally killing Hamlet. Um, and, uh, you know, chooses the latter, not wanting to, to give the game away. Uh, an even bigger question mark here uh, is, of course, whether Gertrude knows or at least suspects uh, that she is drinking poison. Uh, in uh, Act 4, Scene 7, we talked about um, the letter. Uh, the, the, the messenger brings in one uh, letter from Hamlet to Claudius, but you know, these for your majesty, this to the queen, and then leaves to take another letter from Hamlet to his mom. We never find out what it says. And then at the end of that scene, Gertrude enters just after uh, Claudius and Laertes are plotting this whole poison on the swords, poison in the wine, poison everywhere uh, scheme. Are we to believe she overheard any of it? Um, he, he was talking about the poison wine right before she came in. So um, if she overheard that, then uh, she, it, after the way her son treated her for, the, for the, this whole play so far, um, is sacrificing herself uh, to save her son. Um, or maybe she had no idea and just likes drinking. Uh, you know, we don't know. Um, uh, Hamlet and uh, Laertes uh, continue fighting, uh, exchanging swords uh, in the scuffle and wounding each other. Uh, so uh, seeing that, the audience knows that both Hamlet and Laertes have uh, mere minutes to live um, before the poison begins to uh, affect any of them. Uh, the, the I, I suppose, greater quantity of poison in the drink uh, uh, affects the queen. She dies in lines 291, 292. Uh, the king tries to cover it up. She swoons to see them bleed. Uh, there's that uh, uh, conceit in weakest bodies, strongest works idea yet again. Oh, this, uh, oh she, she's just a fragile woman who's dizzy from the sight of blood. Uh, but by that point, even she knows. Uh, that that's not the case. No, no, the drink, the drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink. I am poisoned. Square brackets, italics, dies. Um, so whatever Gertrude did or didn't know, whatever Gertrude was or wasn't in on, whoever Gertrude did or didn't really love, um, she took it to the grave. Uh even whether her, her, her actual death, you know, what was that uh, an accident or was it a noble act of self-sacrifice? Just as we talked about in, back in act one, Gertrude's possible motivations. Was she in on the murder of Hamlet senior? Was the whole thing her idea to begin with? Had she been having an affair uh, with Claudius for years or um, did she, really love her first husband and, and only marry Claudius to secure Ham, Prince Hamlet's succession to the throne, to, to, to stop Claudius from taking a younger wife and having another child who would um, uh, cut ahead of Hamlet in, in this succession. So um, it, it she had a possibly noble and selfless motivation even for the marriage. Uh, Gertrude could be, in short, either the, the worst or the best character in the play, and even with her death, which could be an accident just because she you know likes a good glass of wine as much as uh, her husband does, or could have been a suicide to save her son, who has not been very nice to her for uh, the low these five acts. So ev even in death, Gertrude could be uh, the, the worst or the best, morally speaking, character uh, in the play. Uh, we simply don't know. She remains to the last, the mobilid queen, the masked queen. Uh, that great phrase from 2.2 .2 used 
by the first player in context about uh, Hecuba of Troy fleeing, uh, the muffled Hecuba of Troy fleeing the city in disguise, um, but repeated three times as it is, is probably supposed to make us think uh, of Gertrude. Uh, uh, Laertes uh, chooses that moment to, to uh, double cross the king. Uh, no medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour's life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbaited and envenomed. The foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poisoned, I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. Uh, so at, at that point, uh, Hamlet knows uh, what's actually up. And uh, finally, <laughs> finally, finally, finally stabs Claudius um, in line uh, 304. Um, and Claudius calls for his guards, or yet defend me, friends, I am but hurt. Uh, and Hamlet leaps on him and uh, double kills him, takes the remains of the poisoned wine and uh, jerks back his head and pours it uh, into his mouth. Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this potion. Uh, is thy union here? Follow my mother. Um, and Claudius finally dies. Uh, Hamlet's last words to him, uh, is thy union here? a great uh, uh, triple meaning, right? Union was the old fashioned word for pearl. So that's one meaning. Like, oh, is this your pearl? You know, knowing that it's poison. Um, but also union, uh, a marriage is a union. Like, look where your union with my mother has ended up in this cup of poison. Uh, is your marriage is in this poison cup. Uh, and also union, uh, a, a, a nation state uh, can, can be called a union. Um, so meaning the whole country of Denmark, uh, that there has been something uh, rotten in the state of for as long as Claudius has been on the throne, has also uh, ended up in, in this, this poison cup. The entire royal family is, is uh, in the process of dying and it's being left leaderless. So union here, a, a trinity of meanings, uh, pearl, marriage, and nation. Um, uh, speaking of, of trinities, uh, the idea that we have in, in, uh, in name, a, a sort of secular holy trinity at the center of the play, rather the name Hamlet uh, can refer to uh, both father and son, right? Hamlet Sr. and Hamlet Jr., a change that Shakespeare deliberately made, right? In the old legend, the prince is Omleth and the, the ghost dad is Horvendel. Um, they're only Hamlet Sr. and Hamlet Jr. in uh, Shakespeare's version. Uh, and of course, Hamlet can also refer to uh, not just the prince and the dad, but the play itself. Uh, that's part of the great fun of writing about it. When you say Hamlet in italics, you mean the play. Uh, when you say Hamlet not in italics, you, you mean the prince. Um, so the, the part of that, that great textual fun of making distinctions between Hamlet and Hamlet when one is in italics and one is not. Um, read enough criticism about it and you'll see what I mean. People do it all the time. Uh, so, so we have a, just even in that name, a trinity, right? It, it, the, the, the father and uh, the son and the play uh, are, all, are all Hamlet. Um, uh, now, a note on the fact that uh, Hamlet has finally, uh, in, in these... these uh, you know, three, three or so pages from the end here, uh, gotten around to killing Claudius. The obvious explanation is, well, it's now or never. Hamlet has just been told, you got scratched with a poison sword, you're going to be dead in uh, 30 minutes max. Um, so it can be that Hamlet realizes, well, uh, you know, I've, I've got to do it now or I'm never going to do it. I can't worry about making it perfect anymore. Or you could look at it this way. Uh, I, for one, can't help but noticing that for the entire play, Hamlet's been talking about how, you know, his, his, uh, his dad was perfect, the greatest king, the greatest warrior, the greatest everything else, and his mom is, is terrible. Uh, most pernicious woman, frailty, thy name is woman, uh, all, all, uh, 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 and when he first enters, uh, that pun on calling her common or calling her a slut, 
Um, uh, of course, his extended insults uh, pointed in her direction in Act 3, Scene 4. Um, and yet I can't help but notice, you know, uh, the, the parent that Hamlet supposedly actually loves, his father, uh, orders him to get revenge in Act 1, and Hamlet doesn't do it and 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 doesn't do it. Um, he sees his mother die. Claudius is dead 15 lines later. So there could be a, a uh, we, we might say subconsciously, the parent Hamlet really loves or loves more is, is not the same as the one he thinks he loves more uh, consciously. Um, or, or there can be some kind of division here uh, with, with Shakespeare anticipating not just, just Freud, but going uh, farther than that and anticipating, you know, uh, Lacan and Derrida and all of those guys about, you know, the, the, the uh, mother's body is, is what the, the um, you know, uh, the, the pre-verbal or, or the attachment to the mother's body is pre-verbal, and then the entrance into language is a symbolic separation from the mother's body. Uh, you know, the, the the imaginary order that's pure thought, and the symbolic order where thought is chopped up into words that mostly have empty space between them, and uh, therefore can never be perfect. Um, if if you stayed awake for uh, any any. Uh, this section of that stuff in, in college or grad school, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Shakespeare could be anticipating something like that, where, you know, uh, since the father is the symbolic order, right, our relationship to language, uh, all Hamlet can do in response to his father's death is talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. But when he sees that Claudius is responsible for his mother's death, Hamlet turns around and kills the guy twice immediately um, because it's, it's the, the, the relationship to the mother um, that, uh, that, that, that traffics in emotion and it is emotion, not words and logic that is the basis for action. So uh, uh, Shakespeare, not just um, uh, teaching Freud his business, uh, uh, three plus centuries early, but also teaching uh, teaching the heirs of Freud their business as well, possibly. Possibly, probably. Um, exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet, the dying Laertes begs. Uh, mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. Um, now, I think it's, uh, you know, a, a bit sudden that uh, Laertes suddenly thinks Hamlet is so noble and absolves him of all responsibility uh, for his, his family's uh, deaths. I mean, maybe it's the poison talking. But uh, Laertes is certainly not the only guy that Hamlet has ever worked his magic on. Um, the, the fact that for... for Many centuries now, just about every uh, uh, you know intellectual uh, ha has been for at least some section of their life obsessed with this guy. Um, that that he is um, the, the the most you know attractive, the most fascinating. That you know really since this play was written, in one way or another, every protagonist is Hamlet it's impossible for us to even conceive of a main character who doesn't have something or other uh, in common with, with this guy. Um, you know, even though as befits the protagonist of a tragedy, he does bad things. Um, he, he directly or indirectly kills people. Um, it, 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 every, I mean, Really, every bad thing that happens in the whole play is 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 ultimately his fault somehow, and yet we never, e even though you know some some parts of our brain and some some critics who are anti Hamlet uh, do try and try and try to remind us, you know, you're not supposed to like this guy, you know, add up everything he does, and he's kind of kind of a terrible guy. We can never bring ourselves to hate him, 
uh, you know, the the, wor the best we can do is kind of grudgingly admit, that, well, he's not perfect. Uh, you know, we, we don't feel this way about any of other uh, of, of Shakespeare's other tragic protagonists. You know, we have no trouble um, rejecting Macbeth as a terrible guy immediately. Um, we have uh, no trouble uh, assessing Lear as if we don't think he is a terrible guy, at least assessing him as a, a foolish uh, man who, who uh, one would never wish to emulate, right? Um, you know, nobody watches Lear and, you know, wishes they were more like Lear. Uh, and yet everyone, I think, if, if we're being honest, um, uh, you know, j j just as... Uh, that jazz band in the Aristocats opined that uh, everybody wants to be a cat. Let's be honest, everybody wants to be Hamlet. Um, we may not be able to explain why we do, um, but Hamlet's uh, 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 charisma, uh, uh, outsized personality, the, the, his his gravitational pull, if we want to put it in the astronomical terms um, that, that that the play has been hinting at. You know, uh, everything in this play, uh, <laughs> forget the, the earth and the sun, everything orbits around Hamlet, uh, both in this play and in, you know, all of, of you know, Western culture and storytelling uh, since the play was written. Um, so, you know, if we think it's weird that uh, Laertes is so ready to call this guy noble and forgive him uh, in line 311, well, you know, don't we all? Uh, I am dead, uh, Hamlet declares in uh, line 315, uh, beginning a, a rather long uh, process uh, of dying. He's, he's, it's, it's not his, uh, despite beginning, I am dead, it is his uh, third to last speech rather than his last one. Uh, his last words directed towards his, his dead mother, wretched queen adieu at line 315. Um, now, there are two ways to take that. Uh, it, it's very cutting coming from Hamlet, uh, you know, after we've seen the queen, you know, wipe his, lovingly wipe his brows and, and very possibly sacrifice uh, herself uh, to save him, uh, deliberately drinking the poison wine. The fact that all he has to say to his mother's uh, dead body is wretched queen adieu. Uh, seems uh, pretty cold, but uh, wretched, of course, can mean two things. Um, it can be a, a moral condemnation or it can be indicative uh, of, of suffering, right? As in uh, Amazing Grace, so sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, you know, one who has uh, uh, suffered, one who was pitiable, or, or even, uh, e even more clearly when the poem on the Statue of Liberty uh, refers to the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, it doesn't mean bad people. It means people who have suffered. Um, so, so the wretched queen could be a, a, a low-key forgiveness, uh, finally acknowledging that th this all has been hard uh, for Gertrude as well, not just for Hamlet himself. Um, you that look pale and tremble at this chance, he continues, not addressing anyone in particular. Um, you know, we would think it's Horatio, but the you is a, a plural you. Uh, you that look pale and tremble at this chance that are but mutes or audience to this act. Um, you know, as though he is, as though there is no longer for Hamlet any distinction between the other people on stage, right? The other characters watching him die and the people in the seats in the audience um, watching him die. All of, all of us alike are just... Uh, mutes and audience to this act, sitting here silently uh, watching uh, him die. Um, had I but time, oh, I could tell you, but let it be. There's let it be again. Um, that that that's very tantalizing. Had I but time, I could tell you as much as he talks. Um, as uh, Harold Bloom and, and uh, others before him, I think, uh, observed, uh, part of Hamlet's um, artificial but very persuasive interiority 
um, the idea that as, as much as this guy talks, he, he had even more to say. Now he can't say it because, you know, poison, he's only got a couple of minutes. Um, but, but he, he could have, you know, doubled, tripled, uh, you know, or, or several orders of magnitude beyond a, a, we get the sense that as much stuff as this guy said, and as brilliant as it was, it was somehow only scratching the surface, uh, as, as though we, we, uh, are deal as though Hamlet himself, not just his play is one of, uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway's icebergs with most of its mass, uh, out of sight, out of our sight, uh, beyond our reach, below the surface, uh, only to be uh, guessed at and to be wondered after. Um, uh, as this fell sergeant, death is strict in his arrest, uh, Hamlet observes, you know, no exceptions. Um, now, uh, this uh, uh, fell sergeant, death, uh, strict in his arrest, uh, is a, a punning reference uh, to the guy who is uh, finally going to show up uh, on the next page, uh, Fortinbras, uh, the guy who, who ends up in charge at the end, uh, at the end of it all. Um, I mean, Fortinbras, a name that, that Shakespeare invented, uh, uh, some, uh, French puns there, uh, you know, four in bra, uh, uh, strong in arms, uh, and death is strict in his arrest, right? Strong in his grip. So I think a deliberate pun there on, um, for Ambra, uh, strong in his grip and strict in his arrest. In other words, Fortinbras is death. Fortinbras symbolizes death. Um, uh, Horatio is ready to join Hamlet there uh, around line 323. I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. Here's yet some liquor left. Horatio is going to, like uh, Kent does at the end of Lear, uh, commit suicide. Um, just out of uh, grief or, or to, you know, continue being Hamlet's sidekick in the afterlife or, or, or whatever, but Hamlet stops him. Uh, As thou art a man, give me the cup, let go, by heaven I'll have it. Um, not out of any apparent concern for Horatio himself, um, but rather because, oh God, Horatio, what a wounded name, the thing standing thus unknown shall I leave behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. In other words, dude, you can't kill yourself. You've got to stay up. I know it's, I know it's going to be hard to live without me. <laughs> I know it's going to be really painful to go on in a, a world without Hamlet, you know, getting a chance to talk and everything. I can only imagine how horrible that's going to be for you. But <laughs> um you have to stick around to tell everybody uh, what happened here, to, to, to make sure that everybody gets uh, the, the real story um, of my death. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, observing uh, or, or asking uh, at the end of that speech, what warlike noise is this? We are hearing the drums and the shots from outside of Fortinbras and his army uh, approaching. Uh, Osric uh, confirms, young Fortinbras with conquest come from Poland to the ambassadors of England gives this warlike volley. Now, uh, whether this is uh, Fortinbras attacking or intending to attack uh, the castle, whether the we're going to attack Poland was a, a, a diversion and he, he was planning to still attack Denmark all along, or whether um, he, they really were just fighting Poland and he was just coming back and, and, you know, giving a, a salute and came in to uh, enters at line 346 to say hi and, and you know, discovers that everyone is dead. Um, many film versions uh, cut out uh, Fortinbras uh, entirely. Olivier's famous version, no Fortinbras, no Rosencrantz and Guildenstern either. Um, the, the, the Brana version retains Fortinbras, but uh, makes it explicit that this is a, uh, a sneak attack. We see while all this stuff is going on, guards outside being snuck up on and, and killed by Fortinbras's uh, uh, ninjas um, uh, before they, they, they march in, break down the doors uh, and march into uh, uh, the throne room. 
whether it's an attack or just that he was in the the uh, right place at the right time, uh, Hamlet says, uh, I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice uh, at lines uh, 337, 338. Um, so uh, as far as Hamlet is concerned, sure, what the heck, Fortinbras uh, can be king. Uh, tell him with the occurrence more and less which have solicited. Uh, and, and Hamlet then speaks his, his final four words. The rest is silence. I don't think it's an accident uh, that the last word Hamlet speaks. I think Shakespeare knew that even if he do, was not 100% sure that this was his best play, I think he knew that this was his best guy, You know that, that as far as characters go, that, that this would stand as his greatest creation. Certainly the guy who has the most interesting stuff to say, the uh, character um, through the mouth of whom William Shakespeare took uh, the English language to its 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 greatest it, it's still unmatched it's in principle unmatchable uh, uh, heights of brilliance it's no coincidence that this guy's last word is silence right when hamlet dies the english language itself might as well be dying uh, the rest might as well be silence because no one uh, is ever going to say anything uh, as cool as the stuff this guy said uh, ever again. Uh, whatever we think of him uh, 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 morally, uh, no one can deny that he, he said a whole bunch of, of pretty cool stuff. Um, uh, Horatio's uh, uh, next line is even more famous. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Um, now, in a lot of the, the TV or film productions, you see that's the end of the play. A lot of people, um, uh, you know, I bet if you went around asking people, you know, what's the last line of, of Hamlet, you'd get a whole lot of people telling you uh, something about uh, good night, sweet prince and, and some flights of angels. Um, and a, a lot of the time in, in films, they'll, they'll call the day there. The David Tennant version ends with those lines, despite having bothered to show us Fortinbras and his army in Act 4, Scene 4. I thought that was curious. If you're not going to have Fortinbras show up at the end, why mention or include Fortinbras in those previous scenes at all? It was like they just, you know, ran out of money or something, or they rented the camera and they had to give it back. Anyway, uh, why does the drum come hither, Horatio asks, and at that point, finally, Fortinbras uh, walks in just a couple of lines after Hamlet dies. So they just miss each other once again, right? These two uh, two princes who, who've des whose destinies have been entwined all their lives. Um, one of their dads killed the other one's dad all those, those years ago, both named after their fathers, both supposed to get revenge for their fathers, but heard of each other uh, all their lives, never met. They just miss each other in Act 4, Scene 4. Uh, Fortinbras uh, exits from one, one side of the stage right before Hamlet enters at the other. They just miss each other again. Uh, Hamlet breathes his last um, the, the second and a half uh, before Fortinbras walks in uh, to observe that this quarry cries on havoc. Uh, and to ask, O proud death, what feast is toward in thine eternal cell that thou so many princes at a shot so bloodily hast struck? Um, in other words, uh, what the heck, why is everybody dead? Uh, now, if he had planned an attack, uh, if he had wanted to, to kill everyone himself, then this must be uh, pretty anticlimactic for poor Fortinbras. He, he's been, uh, you know, planning his revenge on Denmark his whole life. And he bursts in the doors. How do you like me now, Denmark? Oh, everybody's dead already? Oh, that was easy. Damn. <laughs> Walks past all the dead people, sits down on the throne. Um, an equally confused English ambassador enters at uh, line uh, 349. Um, uh, to tell us in, in 
certainly the English ambassador's most famous line that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, uh, asking where should we have our thanks and Horatio divulging uh, not from his mouth, pointing to the dead Claudius, not from his mouth had it the ability of life to thank you. He never gave commandment for their, for their death. But since so jump upon this bloody question, you from the Polak Wars and you from England. Um, so, okay, uh, I know you're all looking at me. You walk in, I'm the only one who's still alive. I didn't kill all these people, by the way. <laughs> I know what this looks like. Um, but... Uh, okay, you, uh, Fortinbras uh, of Norway, and now also of Denmark, I guess, uh, English ambassador, uh, I'll explain to you what happened, right? Um, and look at how Horatio puts this, starting in line uh, 359. Give order that these bodies high on a stage be placed to the view, and let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about. So the bodies are going to be placed on a stage, you know, an obvious uh, uh, you know, reference to, to the, 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 all the parallels with, with theater. I mean, the bodies have been, as the audience knows, on a stage the whole time because it's just a play. So we have one last um, uh, uh, nudge to our collective ribs uh, uh, by, by Shakespeare about the fact that, you know, it's all a play um, going all the way back to, Hamlet's, uh, you know, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe back in, in 1.5, meaning his brain, but punning on the name of the theater that we were all sitting in as we originally watched it, um, saying, you hear this fellow in the cellarage about his father beneath the stage using the actual term for the space under the stage, um, uh, uh, observing in uh, 2.2 that... Uh, it, you know, the, the, this goodly frame, the earth, right? The frame theater, the earth, the globe seems to me a sterile promontory, right? That's what a stage is, a sterile promontory. Uh, this this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, he says, ostensibly talking about the skies, but really talking about the painted proscenium arch of the globe. Uh, these moments where Hamlet appears to be on the verge of figuring out that he's a character in a play and that everything around him is fake. Or to Ophelia during the rejection of Ophelia, the get thee to an unary business in Act Three, Scene One, um, uh, speaking to her uh, allegedly about uh, women's uh, dissembling phoniness. Right, God gives you one face and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp. But this would also serve as a reference to the fact that, you know. Uh, in, in Shakespeare's original staging of the play, when women were not allowed to act on the stage, um, Ophelia is being played by a, a, a boy in drag, right? So Hamlet's God gives you one face and you make yourselves another, you jig, you amble, and you lisp could refer to the, the affectations that boy actors would put on to play ladies, just as the, the majestical roof fretted with golden fire means both the real sky and the proscenium arch of the globe. So we've had a, a running uh, a, a whole basket of Easter eggs uh, where characters say things that remind us that it's a play, and it all comes together here. Where uh, Horatio asks uh, Fortinbras to order that all the bodies be put on a stage. Um, let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about, as though Horatio is the surrogate of Shakespeare himself, and now he's going to tell the story. Um, now he's going to write, you know, the play that we've just seen. And what he says next uh, sounds like an advertisement, like a, like a, a trailer, a coming attraction. Uh, for the play. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, deaths put on by cunning and forced cause, and in this upshot purposes mistook fallen on the inventor's heads, all this can I truly deliver. Wait till you hear this story, it's got everything. Right, you know, like he's like he's crafting a, a commercial for this play to get people interested in it. Um, at Fortinbras's response, let us haste to hear it and call the noblest to the audience. Uh, I always imagine, you know, the the the, the lights in in the globe, like beginning to to 
go up. Maybe they were starting to light bit by bit the torches you know, around the exits at that line. Let us haste to hear it and call the noblest to the audience. Uh, Fort Bras may be gesturing to the actual audience um, and the lights beginning to, to illuminate them. Um, and, and he then gets the play's uh, closing speech after observing that uh, I have some rights of memory in this kingdom, which now to claim my vantage uh, doth invite me. So uh, Fortinbras is now king of, of a, a combined, uh, uh, a united kingdom of, of Norway uh, and Denmark. Um, now, whether this was just uh, uh, good luck on, on his part or whether he was planning to uh, burst in and, and kill everybody and take over anyway, and as luck would have it, uh, uh, he didn't, didn't have to. Um, and the, in his very name, right, which Hamlet puns on uh, uniting him with death, Fort in Bras, Fort in Bras, strong in grip, strict in his arrest, as he enters, you know, this points us to something. In a manner of speaking, right, right, uh, Fortinbras is going to show up at the end of all our stories, right? All our stories uh, uh, end with with death. Um, so we we can we can take this as this this darkly comic joke. None of it mattered, right? If Hamlet had killed Claudius on page ten, or if Claudius had killed Hamlet, or we, you know. No matter what, Fortinbras was going to show up at the end and kill everybody anyway. Uh, so, so you know, so none of it mattered, you know, or did it? Because, um, well, as Hamlet himself said, uh, you know, if it if it be not now, why then it be to come? Fortinbras is going to show up eventually for all of us. Um, so, does that mean none of it mattered? Right? Does the, does the fact that every life ends with death? Um, mean that that life did not matter? Uh, well, it's 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 what you do with it, I suppose. Um, before Fortinbras shows up, um, let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage. Uh, the the Norwegian and newly Danish uh, uh, prince and king uh, begins. Uh, so, so there we have Hamlet in death being put uh, where he always, we suspect, wanted to be on a stage. Uh, he wanted to be there as, as an actor, uh, not a corpse, but uh, well, <laughs> sometimes you get what you need. Uh, uh, let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, but he's not just going to be on a stage. He's being given a military funeral. For he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royal. Um, Fortinbras, who never met the guy, you know, just missed him twice, uh, comes in right after he dies. Uh, and so we have the play's last act of, of misprision, of looking at something and getting fooled by what's on the outside. Right, the, This thing that's happened so, so, so many times. Uh, that Hamlet himself introduced as a major theme in his very first uh, uh, speech, excluding one line, uh, wisecracks, uh, uh, seems, madam, nay, it is, I know not seems. Uh, now it is the dead Hamlet himself who seems like a soldier to Fortinbras. He was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royal. We look at other things, we look at other people, and we interpret them in our own terms. Fortinbras was Mr. Army Guy, it was Mr. Military Commander, um, leading his uh, army of such mass and charge across the stage back in 4.4. Um, he looks at Hamlet, oh, there's Hamlet Jr. There, there's the guy whose dad killed my dad. I wonder what he was like, and assumes, oh, he was probably just like me, right? That's the mistake we all make. We assume other people are like us. Uh, assuming based on nothing, he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royal. I never knew this Hamlet guy, but he was probably, you know, a military commander, just like me. Let's give him a military funeral. Um, the soldier's music and the rights of war speak loudly for him. Uh, we can think of uh, uh, almost no music and rights less appropriate to a funeral for, for Hamlet. 
for uh, uh, histories, for li literature's most famous uh, uh, intellectual, uh, this guy who had such trouble uh, uh, committing violence. Uh, such a sight as this becomes the field, but here shows much amiss. Go, bid the soldiers shoot. The last line of the play, go, bid the soldiers shoot, um, is an order, a military order. Right, the, the, the last line of the play is a military order being given by a commander to subordinates, an order to shoot. Soldiers are mentioned. What is a soldier? Well, it's someone who receives an order, often an order to commit violence, and commits it. You know, And no disrespect to soldiers, I'm just saying that's what the definition of, of soldiering is. Right, There's a chain of command. Orders are followed. If they aren't, everything falls apart. Hamlet is the opposite of that. You know, what, what, what we've had here for five acts now is a guy who, you know, at the beginning of this story receives an order to commit violence and questions it 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 and, questions it and uh, along the way ends up questioning just about everything. Uh, uh, that has anything to do with the experience of being a human being who is alive uh, in the world. Um, so the, the, the fact that this guy, the, the whatever you call the opposite of a soldier, that's what Hamlet was. The, the play closes with one enormous, uh, cosmically uh, ironic, dramatically ironic bit of of misprision. Hamlet is mistaken for a soldier and, and uh, uh, given uh, a, a funeral uh, accordingly. We know uh, that this is the very opposite uh, of appropriate. and uh, we're, we're the only ones left. Um, that is uh, everything I can think of to say about Hamlet. Um, and so uh, in the name of the king and the prince and the play itself, amen.